Well, hello again. It's uh, Dean Tenney here, coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. We're working our way through an explication of the FINRA Series 7 content outline. Uh, as we said, uh, the test writing committee gets together. There are four critical functions to being a broker. And uh, this is the content outline. Uh, a lot of times people say, how do you know that's on the test? I say, well, if it's not in the content uh, outline, they're not allowed to ask you about it, right? So we've already explicated uh, critical function one. We've explicated uh, critical function two to being a broker. We're working on the most important thing that brokers do and the biggest thing on the test, and that's providing uh, basic product information to customers, you know, recommendations, investment vehicles, 91 questions. And so far we have explicated of that third section options. And so we're gonna explicate, we're chunking this one out and we're gonna be doing uh, munis. And we'll just continue to kind of knock them out in chunks until we get the whole third section uh, done, which is the biggest uh, part of your exam. Um, these are no substitute for the uh, lectures, I always say. I would use these as kind of like an intellectual inventory. And I'm gonna put these at the front of the playlist for each of those. We have, I think about three hours of uh, municipal bond lectures. I'm pretty proud of them. There's not any lectures, obviously I'm not proud of, but uh, my muni lectures are pretty spot on. So again, as I always say in these explications, we are not trying to uh, lecture. You know, this is no substitute for the lecture and your other study materials. This is a way for you to have a check mark of stuff you should be aware of as you continue to do it. So that's where we're at today. We're in function three, providing customer with information about investments and making recommendations. Very small part of function three is transferring assets and maintains appropriate records. What I've been doing with function three is as I go through each of these subject areas on the investment vehicles, which is the vast majority of the 91 questions, I'm just putting function three provides customer with information about whatever it is the investment I'm talking about. So. Uh, the title of the last explication was function three provides customer the information about options and makes recommendations. Today will be a uh, title of the uh, thing when I put it up on the YouTube channel will be uh, explication or will be function three provides customer information about uh, municipal bonds and makes recommendations. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, I put this up on the channel uh, just so you know, if you're new, new with us on, on the YouTube channel, uh, what we do is we... Uh, put the stuff up on the YouTube channel as a premiere. And then as a premiere, what happens is when that premieres, uh, I'll be there to run a, a chat alongside of that uh, premiere. And so that's kind of cool for you. That's a time if you have any questions about the, actually the premiere, the lecture we're watching together, you know, after the premiere, it goes up on the, on the YouTube channel just as a regular lecture. But I'll be there to run a chat and uh, we can ask you or answer any questions you have about either the, the lecture we're gonna be watching together or any other items you have for many of your other FINRA exams, SIE, or whether you have uh, questions about your NASA exam, 63, 65, 66, that's another opportunity to get that uh, answered for you. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> All right. Mm. Trying to find the munis here. Where's our munis? Munis, munis, munis. I must have passed them up a couple times. There's equity. I have a great equity lecture for you. There's rights and warrants. There's mutual funds. There's a nice mutual fund lecture. I don't have anything on variable annuities on the YouTube channel because it's not a big deal, but I'll eventually I'll explicate that. And I think that would be sufficient for passing the test. REITs. Hmm, where did the uh, munis go? Maybe they're on the very end. That's kind of weird. I don't write the content outline, but I would have put munis before options, but. See if Dean can't find them, that's going to be a problem. Hmm. <laughs> Gee, what is going on? What is going on? Dead securities. There's the options. We've done that. There is packaged products. There is stock. And there is that. Hmm. 
There we go. Just about to give up. Just about to give up. So, all right. So, uh, municipal securities, general characteristics of municipal fund securities, methods of quotation, uh, yield uh, basis, dollar price, interest rate payment, interest rate payment uh, periods, denominations, diversify, uh, diversity of maturity, diversity of maturities, and legal opinion. All right. Well, let's get started. So, uh, quotations for uh, serial bonds. And I always try and get us a different color when we're doing applications. Uh, make a note of our timestamp here. I'm trying to keep these things down to uh, a reasonable length of time, but you know it's not a big deal because you guys have a pause button, right? So if it gets to be too much for you, you can just you know hit the pause button, take a break, step away, come back. Anyways, uh, serial bonds. Serial bonds are bonds with different maturity dates, and uh, those are quoted on a yield uh, to maturity basis. Yield TM, the fancy word for yield maturity is basis. And, you know, uh, term bonds are typically uh, quoted on uh, a price. And remember that price is a percentage of par. And then remember all municipal securities uh, trade, all debt securities, for example, trade over the counter. And so that uh, minimum spread I'm going to have in terms of I work the bond desk is going to be an eighth in terms of those prices. That's an eighth of 1% or $1.25. And so that'll be the minimum spread I'm ever going to make if I'm trading corporates or uh, muni bonds. So, you know, 98 and 3 eighths, for example, would be uh, 98 is easy. That's 98% of par. That's $980. And then 3 eighths of $10, because that's what a bond point is, would be 983.75. And we should probably put that in there as well. A bond point is $10. Uh, so methods of quotation, by the way, the exception to that, remember, there are certain uh, exceptions where the MSRB says I should quote yield to uh, call and not yield to maturity or the basis. And so for bonds that are trading at a premium, uh, we should quote and MSRB requires to be on the comm firm. Uh, yield to call because it's very likely when you're buying a bond at a premium you know that those uh, you know bonds are going to be called uh it says interest rate that's also known as the coupon so the interest rate the bond pays is also known as aka the coupon aka also known as the nominal yield you know, what would they call it on your exam, whatever you're not prepared for, right? Now, of all the rates you're held accountable for on the exam, that one doesn't change, right? So the issuer says we're going to pay 4% or 5%, whatever the case may be. And, you know, that's pretty much it. Uh, payment periods, the bonds pay semi-annually. Semi-annually. And that means the bonds are either going to be J and J. That would be a bond that pays in January 1st and July 1st or they could be uh, J and J15. That would be a bond that pays uh, January and July 15th. It could be F and A or F and A15. You know, those are all the different times that the bonds would pay. It could be M and S, that's March and September. Kind of like learning a foreign language or M and S15. Uh, let's see, so M&S, then that would be uh, January, February, March, April, April and October, or a and 15. Or let's see, we're at May and November, or M and N 15, by the way, it wouldn't be May, November, they'll say M and N, so it's kind of like learning a foreign language. M and N 15. And then we would have June, J and D, or J and D 15. You know, there's no thing of the bond that pays, you know, on the 10th, they either pay on the 1st, or they pay on the 15th, and you know, if I'm diversifying your portfolio, I might want to diversify you by what are called the dated dates. So those are actually the technical name for those. In fact, let's put that in there. A different color. The data dates uh, are what that's the technical name for that. The data dates. 
I want to put that in a different color. And the data dates. You know, I told you should print this out and have this uh, available to you. But whenever you're watching the YouTube channel too, I highly recommend you have a you know stack of three by five or four by six cards, a pad of paper, because you know you should be taking notes. And data dates are a, a good flashcard if you don't have it already somewhere in your notes. So this is a good flashcard fodder. And this is the date, the dates, the bond starts to accrue interest for the next time frame. All right, so let's see, we got the interest rate, we got our payments periods, denominations. You know, the normal block of denominations and, you know, muni bonds is 25, 50, 100. So the question here is if it's not a normal block of denominations, obviously somebody should know that. If it's some baby bond, it's got some, you know, funky kind of denomination, we should know like 5M or whatever the case may be. Uh, we probably want to diversify you uh, by maturity. You know, we might want to create for you a uh, laddered bond portfolio where we always have bonds coming due that we can invest at today's uh, interest rate. Or we might want to deploy a, a barbell strategy. You know, these are strategies. These strategies in terms of bonds are more testable on your 65, 66 than on your seven, but we would want to diversify you. So we always have some bonds coming due in case, you know, interest rates go up and your bond portfolio goes down. We have some bonds coming due. We talked about the cereal already. Let's put that up here. I think we said cereal. Let's get a different color here. Let's make sure we got it uh, where we can get it. We said uh, serial bonds have different maturity dates. And uh, term maturities, we said all the bonds come due at once. All bonds come due at the same, yeah, on the same date. Okay, uh, legal opinion. Ooh, that's important. Legal opinion. So let's put that there. Uh, let's get a different color for our legal opinion. Let's see. We've used purple. We've used red. Let's lose. Uh, let's see. Let's use. How about blue? Uh, the legal opinion is done by the bond council. The legal opinion is done. You know, that's testable. Know who does it? It's a bond council, and the bond council is going to uh, render a legal opinion. He's going to opine, he or she, it's a law firm, it's not like an individual. They're going to opine uh, about whether they have the legislative authority to issue the uh, bonds, uh, that these bonds uh, pay interest that is federally tax exempt, uh, that these bonds are, are exempt from 33, I mean, we don't have a prospectus. Now, you know, more often than not, since we've, uh, you know, been selling people investments, they've grown accustomed to saying, hey, can you send me something? You know, and, you know, they just kind of when I go to sell a brand new mini bond, goes, can you send me something? And so they're exempt from the prospectus requirement, 33. But we have a prospectus-like document. That's called the official statement. But so he's going to, uh, that's what the bond council is going to pine about. And uh, the bond council, oh, it looks like I misspelled a statement there. Um, the bond council is either going to give us a qualified legal opinion, which is uh, bad. That means uh, it has reservations about whether this, all these things we're talking about are true. Maybe, they, you know, he's not quite sure because they didn't take a vote if it's a GO bond, for example. Or he's going to give us an unqualified legal opinion, which is better. That means no reservations about what, am I, what I'm opining about. Uh, so that would be preferable. And that's without reservations. Now, over the years, uh, some bonds have lost their legal opinion. And so if there's no legal opinion available, we would say that the bond is trading X legal. And that is a muni bond that has no legal opinion available. Ex legal municipal bond trading without a legal opinion. 
Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, legal opinion, purpose, and contents. We gave that to you. You know that we've done by the you know the issuer to hire the bond council to give us this uh, legal opinion, and it looks like uh, now we're down here uh, in terms of our function three. Uh, analysis of municipal bonds. So we'd probably want to diversify you geographically. And uh, we can certainly do that by uh, investing even outside of your state, right? So I say, listen, it behooves you to buy muni bonds of the state of your, that you're a resident of. Because as a resident of a particular state, for example, if you are a resident of California and you buy California bonds or political subdivisions of California, uh, you know, they could tax you, but choose not to. You know, the U.S. Treasury would like to, but can't. And you say, well, Dean, how can I diversify geographically? You know, my example of California, we might say, well, let's get you some Southern California bonds. Uh, let's get you some uh, Northern California bonds. Uh, let's get you some uh, big city bonds. Get you some San Francisco bonds. Get you some uh, Los Angeles bonds. And, uh, you know, maybe we can get you some rural bonds where, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mariposa County is Yosemite National Park. So maybe we get you some Mariposa County. You know, who cares? The point is, I can also diversify you by, by getting you territories. If I say who cares, that just means for test purposes. So remember that. That's another way I can diversify you out to the state. I could get you Puerto Rico bonds or Guam bonds or whatever uh, of, uh, they happen to be. I can uh, diversify you by type. There are two types of muni bonds, very important. The two types we have are general obligation bonds and uh, revenue bonds. Uh, listen, I think a lot of people get hung up. They think there's a zillion type of bonds or there's not. There's only two. There's general obligation bonds and the revenue bonds. That's pretty much it. So rating, we can diversify you by rating to get your yield up. So I might want to get you some uh, AAA, AA, single A, maybe even uh, scoop down for a triple B if we think it's a, a good value proposition. Uh, you should definitely know that if I'm going to diversify you by rating, I shouldn't go below triple B, you know, without, you know, checking with you or being sure that I understand that below triple B is uh, less than investment grade. So triple B is investment grade less than triple B, very testable, is less than investment grade. Now on the test, we never say junk because one man's tr junk is another man's treasure, right? Uh, city of Chicago, for example, right now is a double B. So city of Chicago is less than an investment grade. Uh, let's see, uh, analysis of geo bonds including characters to the issue, nature of the issuer's debt. So let's do that first. Factors affecting the issuer's ability to pay and debt ratios. All right, so uh, on GO bonds, on GO bonds, the nature of the issue is debt. What we're concerned with is overlapping or overlapping debt or coterminous co debt. Whoop, let me get different colors, sorry about that. I always like to use different colors because I'm trying to make it clear to you, uh, you know, what is a, you know, uh, an explication that is Dean is doing versus what is the FINRA uh, document. It's not a big deal, but you know, if you're using this as an intellectual inventory, that's kind of what the idea is. Anyways, let's see, where was I? Um, nature of the issue, oh, I was over at overlapping debt. You know, uh, coterminous. You know, coterminous is when two or more taxing agencies Share some of the same geographic boundaries. And are able to issue debt separately. Uh, you know, uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, but Las Vegas is 100% coterminous with Clark County. You can't be in Las Vegas without being Clark County, Nevada. You could certainly be in Clark County and not be in Las Vegas. So, you know, Las Vegas is 100% coterminous uh, with Clark County, but Clark County is not coterminous uh, with uh, um, uh, Las Vegas. You could be in Summerlin, you could be in Henderson, you could be somewhere else. 
The assumption here, though, is that my property taxes, that's important, property taxes, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes said uh, taxes are the price you pay for civilization. And property taxes are what supports local government. And, you know, the point here is I'm going to have to support more than one local government. I can support the city, the county, right? Uh, so support the local government. And I always joke, if you ask your real estate agent how coterminous is the home you're considering purchasing, we're asking how many people are going to be looking to you through a property tax. Now, kind of a trick, right? We don't finance state government, you know, uh, no overlapping debt for states, uh, no, coterminous, no coterminous for states. And that makes sense because, you know, the states don't support themselves uh, with property taxes. You know, state government is financed primarily for test purposes. I mean, it's outside of the test, that might not be true, but for test purposes, uh, supported with typically income taxes and sales taxes. All right, so uh, one uh, thing we have here, it says characters to the issuer. You know, general obligation bonds is what we're talking about right now. And I just told you that it's based on, do they have taxing authority, right? So I told you states have taxing authorities, cities, counties, school districts have taxing authority. And so that is, uh, you know, the people who can issue these things, right? The characters of the issuer, uh, their ability to pay. We want them to be both able and willing to pay. And one of the debt ratios we use for GO bonds is called the collection ratio. Now the collection ratio is how much of the uh, taxes are current versus how much of the taxes are not current. So for example, I said political subdivision A has a collection ratio of 80%. That means 20% of the taxes are delinquent. If I say political subdivision B has 95%, that means only 5% of their taxes are uh, uh, late or are overdue. So that collection ratio is used with a general obligation debt. And, uh, you know, that, the debt, you know, what they're trying, I wouldn't do while I'm talking to you, but in terms of this explication, one thing I would recommend is at some point, whether it's while watch, watch, watching my two lectures on minis or this explication or in your own study effort with your own study materials, uh, fold a sheet of paper in half and on one side, write all the terms associated with geo bonds and on the other, all the terms associated with revenue bonds. That's a big part of your exam is distinguishing between GOs and revenues in this category, critical function fee uh, three, providing basic product information. Uh, here we're providing basic product information about municipal bonds uh, to someone, right? Uh, we'd like to see a gap uh, between assessed valuation and full estimated value because that means as the properties turn over, you know, we can come back, the a city can and get some more um, money. All right, so let's see, uh, municipal debt ratios, we talked about that one. All right, so let's talk about some uh, revenue bonds here. So uh, revenue bonds, feasibility study. You know, I always joke when I'm lecturing that I've never seen a feasibility study, a person who tells them what they're considering is not uh, feasible. Uh, let's just get a different color here. You know, one thing I'm going to be interested in here is, is there competitive facilities? You know, if I'm uh, financing an airport, you know, where's the nearest airport somebody can go to? Uh, that wasn't a good idea. Let's go back. It's putting it into the same font and style as uh, the FINRA content outline. And I don't want like that because I want to stand out. So let me get here. I get my own new bullet. All right. So. Uh, competitive facilities, whether it's airports or stadium or whatever it is that I'm financing as a bondholder or prospective bondholder, uh, I would like to know where there are competitive facilities. Uh, protective covenants, the trust indenture, very important. You know, the trust indenture, you know, they're going to try and torment you on your exam about documentation documents. And so I want you to be very clear on your exam about the difference between the trust indenture, which we're discussing now, a written set of promises, the protective covenants, right? And the official statement, the notice of sale, those are all different things. So, you know, you wanna stuff it all up in your brain housing group, but at some point you wanna work on uh, delineating it. And so that trust indenture is the written uh, co covenants or promises between the issuer the municipality 
and the trustee for the benefit of the bondholders. FBO means for the benefit of. If you're going to be in our industry for a long time, you should probably should know that. The benefit of the bondholders. And, you know, there's a, you know, a lot of stuff in there. I'll leave it to you to watch the lecture to know, uh, you know, all the stuff that is found in the trust indenture. But the two that we're, you know, primarily concerned with, you know, here in this explication, again, the explications aren't me trying to uh, redo uh, the lecture. My, you know, our lecture is just trying to help you do an intellectual inventory. But uh, one thing you definitely want to know is the flow of funds. You should always assume on your exam a net revenue pledge. And you should know that a net revenue pledge, the operations and maintenance fund, has priority. You know, it also have in there other things will be found in the protective covenants, for example, uh, you know, that they're going to have auditing procedures in place, you know, that whether there's call features, what are the call features, what are the call, you know, pr uh, protection, do they have a put provision, for example, um, you know, non-discriminatory, non meaning everybody's got to pay the use of facility, unless they're spelled out in advance, that kind of stuff. So uh, restriction of the additional bonds, we have two versions of the uh, uh, these revenue bonds, we have open end, open end, we can continually issue a new share, a new bonds. Uh, as long as we meet the, uh, you know, additional bonds test. You know, that could be, for example, uh, debt service coverage ratio. You know, as long as we uh, are maintained, like maybe we promised we would maintain as an issuer, a debt service coverage ratio of two to one. And we have debt service coverage ratio of three to one. I say to chief financial officer, you know, how many bonds can I issue without violating the additional bonds test? You know, uh, or uh, we could have a closed in revenue bond and a closed in, we can only issue new bonds to make the facility operational. You know, so like it's an airport or something and we, I was given a lecture, uh, the idea of the uh, Denver International Airport, $2 billion, we do 500, 500, 500, 500, and we get it all done. So. Closed in uh, only issue new bonds to make the facility operational. All right, so we talked about the restrictions on the issuance of additional bonds. We talked about the flow of funds. Uh, we talked about the earnings or debt service coverage ratio. Uh, there's all kinds of different credit uh, information and rating services. You know, um, we have the, the big ones on the test or our standard Boards and Moody's, but there's also uh, Fitches and there's also White's. So there's a lot of these credit agencies as it relates to munis. Um, again, I gave you the most important thing about the rating services, not so much the services, but, but the ratings themselves. And the one they like is, uh, you know, standard pours. Uh, credit enhancement, some uh, bonds have insurance. So credit enhancement is insurance. It's insurance for the uh, timely payment of interest in principal if the bonds default, if the municipal, if the issuer defaults. Interest and principal if the issuer defaults. So you call me and say, hey, Dean, I, I saw the municipal uh, palatee defaulted, for example, Detroit. Uh, tell me the bonds I have are insured. I said, let me check. I said, oh yeah, good news. They're insured. Now, remember what you get tested on is making sure you understand what they don't insure. So they insure the timely payment of interest and principal. They do not insure the secondary market price. Uh, purpose of specific types of uh, bonds. So we have limited tax bonds versus unlimited tax bonds. So let's do that one first. So we're talking about types of municipal bonds. I think of these as subcategories, by the way. So, you know, they either go into the category of geo or revenue. And then I think of the, you know, all this stuff we're going to talk about is, you know, uh, subcategories. But in the geo category, we have limited, uh, let's get our different color, versus unlimited tax bonds. 
you know, a limited tax bond, I'm telling the, you know, bondholders, hell or high water, limited versus unlimited. You know, I'm telling the bondholders with limited that, you know, I'm only going to charge X number of taxes, mill rates, not decibel, mill rate. And if that mill rate doesn't pay interest in principle, the bonds are going to default. Whereas it's an unlimited tax bond, I'm telling the bondholders, hell or high water, we will charge whatever is necessary to pay back these bonds. So if two mills doesn't get it done, we go to three mills, four mills, four or five mills. You know, we also have in the municipal market, uh, geo bonds, limited tax, we have uh, notes, we have municipal money market securities. Very testimonial that money market security is high quality debt maturing in less than a year. High quality debt maturing in less than a year. And so a lot of municipalities will go to a tax-free money market fund manager, a tax-free money market fund manager, and say, how about I give you some tax anticipation notes? You know, I'm anticipating some money, but I'd like a cash advance. I think of this as kind of like the muni equivalent of borrowing against receivables. You know, the municipality says, uh, I'm anticipating, I'm anticipating a grant, but I'd like the money now. You know, these will all be found in a tax-free money market fund. Kind of uh, interesting, be careful because usually notes means, you know, uh, two to 10 years, but not in the muni business. And the muni business, a note is less than 12 months. So, you know, be a little careful there. You know, I'm anticipating some taxes and revenues, but I'd like a cash advance. That would be a tax and revenue anticipation note. And then, you know, bond anticipation note you get from your underwriter. So, you know, the underwriter for the state of California is J.P. Morgan and uh, Merrill Lynch. And so, you know, if they go to underwrite, this was uh, earlier this year, they did a $2 billion uh, underwriting for the state of California. And they said to um, uh, to uh, Merrill Lynch and Bank of America Merrill Lynch and to J.P. Morgan, can we have a $500 million cash advance? They say, yeah, that's fine. And then when they sell the bonds, they'll get back their money and a little extra, a little vig, a little extra. Uh, special tax, key point. The word that is important here is special. Special, this isn't a general tax going into the general budget. No, no, no. It's a special tax for a special purpose. So let's do that one first. Special tax. Sometimes we call these sin taxes. It could be alcohol. It could be, you know, uh, cigarettes. Uh, you know, it could be you know, um, a hotel or motel, so a special tax. And then the whole point here, the special tax is insufficient, uh, the bonds default. A moral obligation bond. Is where we ask the state if they'd be morally obligated to pay back the bonds. So, you know, we go as a maybe, you know, uh, the John C. Fremont Hospital, very small rural hospital, goes to the state and says, listen, we'd like to issue $10 million worth of bonds to update, modernize, and expand our rural hospital. The state legislature says, legislature says go for it. And they say, okay, and they issue the bonds. Now, if you buy the bonds, they say, John C. Fremont Hospital Revenue District bonds, comma, a moral obligation of the state of, in this case, California. Now, key point here, is you may or may not get paid because of the bonds default, they're gonna take a vote and they're gonna say all in favor of paying back the moral obligation bondholders say aye, all opposed say no, and you may or may not get back. That the whole process is called legislative apportionment, legislative apportionment. In a double barrel bond, there are two promises. You know, I promise if I don't get you with the first shot, I'm gonna get you with the second shot. Uh, I might be calling that incorrectly, a double barrel. So two promises. Uh, the first promise is a user fee. I'll just put that in. And if the user fee is insufficient, the second promise is the full faith and credit of the municipality. So this does have some stickiness to the city. This is a type of a, a GO, you know, and it's called a double barrel because we have two promises there. 
right? And, uh, you know, th that means the voters have to vote in favor of issuing that. We have a taxable build America bonds. You know, some bonds where we're supporting, for example, private activities, private activities, not a public purpose. The IRS says, you know, those bonds can and will be taxed. So, you know, um, I haven't had anybody in years tell me seen anything about a build America bond. The one that shows up a lot on the exam is IDAs, industrial development agency bonds or IDRs. And those are preference items for the AMT. So it'd be an unsuitable recommendation for somebody who's subject uh, to the alternative minimum tax. That's the one that shows up a lot. Uh, I haven't seen, well, OIDs, yeah, you know, you're gonna get more tests on zero coupon bonds and OIDs on corporates, but, you know, just so you know, you know, here the imputed interest you would be receiving because we're talking about a muni uh, would be, um, uh, would be tax-free. Whereas if it was a zero coupon bond that came somewhere else, corporation or treasury, there would be some tax implications. Uh, certificates of participation or type of uh, revenue bond. And I talked about the AMT. Uh, IDRs and ADR, uh, IDAs are supported by the lease revenue from the corporation leasing the facility. And that means corporate, very testable. That means corporate credit backs the bonds. Uh, AMT, we talked about that. Variable rate securities uh, move against some base rate, whatever that base rate is spelled out. And auction rate securities have uh, really got a nasty reputation and uh, the auctions have failed. So, you know, failed auctions means you're going to get paid nothing and you got your money. But they, anytime somebody tells you, sells you a product that's too good to be true, you get the advantage of short term with higher interest rates, probably not going to be a problem. Again, this was very popular and was testable. I haven't had anybody tell me they've seen one in a while, but, uh, you know, if you see one, you know, you know, uh, say something. What's that they say about terrorist activity? See, see something, say something. So uh, pay afford it to your other uh, test takers if you see something. Uh, 529 plans, ABLE accounts. For some reason, I've, I mentioned this before, um, when they changed the uh, seven to the, you know, this new regime, new if you're an old guy like me, but, you know, uh, to the SIE and then this top off series seven, even though this is in the content outline that we're going over, and that means it is fair game to test you on it, it seems like what they've done is kind of put some of the questions in the SIE that then don't show up on the top off. What I mean by that is, for example, economics is very testable in the SIE, not so much anymore on the Series 7. And that's the same here with these 529s. I mean, if you're taking an SIE, I don't know why you'll be doing this explication, but there are certainly test questions on the SIE about a 529 versus a Coverdell. And there's definitely questions about ABLE accounts and liquid gov uh, local government investment pools. But for whatever reason, uh, that doesn't seem to show up uh, on the seven top off. But again, if you see something, uh, say something. Uh, we, I, I conduct a lot of debriefs. So, you know, it's not, Dean's not making this stuff up. I mean, you know, we, you know, I do a lot of debrief. I try make an effort to do as much debrief as possible. Uh, you know, people aren't allowed to ask you like particular questions. I can't say, what was question 35? I can say, hey, when I explicated the, the content outline, is it something you think I should have spent some more time on? Or, you know, I can say things like that. So uh, call features, uh, you know, call risk. Let's put that there, very testable. Let me get a different color thing. Uh, I'm just checking my time here. I'm about 30 minutes in, so. Um, you know, that's why I broke this thing up because again, we would be talking for hours to get through the, the section three, critical function three. Uh, but anyways, I, I want to make sure that we, you know, I told you there's no substitute, but if I can give you some questions that, that I do, you have what's called call risk and call risk, very testable is associated with declining interest rate environment. You know, the idea here is that if interest rates go down, the issuer is going to want to call the bonds. So call risk is associated with the declining interest rate environment. There are two types of bonds that have no call risk. They are zero coupon bonds and treasuries, US treasury bonds. And so, you know, any other type of bond we're discussing uh, would have that. So, you know, a lot of times you say, well, gee, interest rates go down, that's wonderful. My bond goes up. 
I said, well, that's true, but that means it more likely for them to call the bonds. Now, what prevents the issuer from calling the bonds is what we call call protection. And call protection consists of two things, the time and the price. So how long before they can call the bond and at what price can they call the bond? That's called call protection, call protection. So if they call it a par, they call it a premium. You know, uh, is there a mandatory call? Partial calls is where the issuer doesn't have enough to call all the bonds and so they call some of the bonds and partial calls are done by lottery or randomly. Again, I'll, I'll leave it to you to go to lecture. I'm just explicating the, the content outline. I'm not lecturing, but I have three hours of municipal lectures and there's probably 30 minutes on this thing. I'm just putting into this thing. I'll leave it to you. As I mentioned, what I would probably use this explication, when I start doing the explications of the content outlines, we're doing the seven first. I've done the first section of the SIE. I owe some 66, some more content. So we'll put that up on the channel. Uh, but I wasn't sure if people were going to find this productive or not, but we had some good feedback. So as long as the feedback is good, you know, I, I'll continue to do things. You know, somebody says, Dean, it was a waste of time. I'll hit the delete key and we'll start over. But anyways, uh, I just want to remind you that what I would probably use explications uh, for is again, kind of like an intellectual inventory. That's why I'm putting it at the front of the playlist for each of the lectures. So this will be in front of munis. And that way, when you're watching the three hours of munis, you know, lectures or reading your student study manual or watching other guys on videos do what Dean's doing, you know, you can use that to kind of, you know, maybe check the box and say, yeah, I, I intellectually own that. If, or if not, you're listening to me now and you're not quite sure what that is, well, you say, whoa, let me put that on my to-do list of things I'm gonna have to get under control. Um, sinking funds, some bonds have a sinking fund, some bonds do not. A sinking fund is where we put aside the money we're gonna need to, you know, pay the bonds at some point. And so sink, a bond with a sinking fund is gonna have better credit quality than a bond without a sinking fund. Now, a bond without a sinking fund, I just say, I'll figure it out when I get there. <laughs> you know? and, uh, not so much than a bond without. Uh, let's see, our next extraordinary calls, uh, very testable. We have what are called catastrophe calls. And a catastrophe call, let's see how do you spell catastrophe, catastrophe. Uh, that is in the trust indenture. But the MSRB, the Municipal Security Board, says I do not need to disclose a catastrophe call. So extraordinary or an extraordinary call is a catastrophe call. And that need not be disclosed to an investor according to the MSRB. Uh, need not be disclosed to an investor. Uh, looks like it's telling me I didn't spell that right. I'll leave it up to you guys to figure, figure out how to spell that. Uh, let's see, so we got uh, extraordinary calls. Whole calls are easy, right? We just call the bonds. The advantages and disadvantages. So the call uh, provisions, as we said, are advantageous to the issuer in a declining interest rate environment. And that means we would expect, that means we would expect as a uh, bondholder, as a bondholder, to get paid, uh, you know, a little higher coupon, right? I said, well, listen, if I'm taking the chance that you can call this away from me, uh, you know, I think you should pay me a little higher interest. So uh, bonds without call provisions are going to have a uh, higher price and lower yield. Uh, so advantageous, disadvantageous to the issuer. So uh, here the question is, it's advantageous to the issuer and it is disadvantageous. Let's just go ahead and put it there to the Bond order because you don't want to give up your bonds, right? Because particularly if interest rates have gone down, you say, I don't know, I want to keep them. Do the bond holder. Uh, put our tender issues, that is advantageous to you. Some bonds have that, some bonds do not. That's the bond holder who can put the bond back to the issuer. You know, and a put uh, or tender option, a put option would be advantageous to the bondholder, particularly in a uh, rising interest rate environment. I say, listen, I brand new bonds pay more than this one. And here's your bond back. So it's a put provision allows me to put it back to the issuer. Advantage of the bondholder in a rising interest rate environment. Some bonds have it, some bonds do not. 
You say, hey, Dean, the Muni you're uh, offering me has a uh, higher price and a lower yield than other bonds I've been looking at. I just want no surprise because it's got a put provision. That's a pretty nifty thing to be able to do, right? Uh, let's see. So uh, let's see. We're talking about sinking funds. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, it looks like we covered that. So it looks like we're on refunding methods. Direct exchange versus sale of a new issue. Advanced refunding, refunding at a call at the call date. Current refunding, extra estimated crossover refunding. So, boy, that's that's a mouthful. You know what uh, issuers will some sometimes do is issue new bonds. Let me get a. This is called let's call pre-refunding or refunding. And uh, pre-refunding is selling new bonds in advance of the call date. Ooh. Uh, selling new bonds. In advance of the call date. And the reason you would do that is, you know, as I come to you as a municipal finance, uh, financial advisor, I say, listen, you're paying 5% on bonds. Right now I could sell some new bonds at 2%. You see, you say, Dean will sell what? I mean, you know, I can't call the bonds for another three years. I said, well, yeah, but we can put the money into an escrow account and buy some state and local government securities. And that way, when the bonds are uh, past their call protection period, we can call the bonds. So we sell new bonds, place the funds in an escrow account. By the way, we sell the new bonds so we can call the old bonds when they pass the call protection period. You know, um, we're going to put the proceeds, as I said, into that uh, escrow account. We're going to buy what are called slugs. I wouldn't worry about, but state and local government securities. I'm not allowed to have an arbitrage opportunity here. And, uh, you know, uh, what I'm going to do, you own the, uh, let's say you own, that's for, that stands for state and local government security. You have to buy a particular type of security to put in this escrow account. Um, you only own the 5% bonds that aren't callable for another five years. Right. You, you, I call you, say, hey, Dean, I, what's, what's up? I said, I'm calling you about those uh, fives. Fives means 5%. Those bonds you own. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I love them, Dean. They're not called for another three years. I said, well, you know what they've done? They've refunded them. They've refunded them. They sold some new issue, a new issue. They have advanced refunded them. And that means they're going to call them away from you at the call date. He goes, well, great, Dean. They owe me the money. They've got the money. I say, yes, but the uh, problem is you're not going to receive yield to maturity. So the old bonds, the old bonds that have been pre-refunded, you know, they might say pre-refunded or refunded, have to be uh, quoted on a yield to call basis because it's, you know, you're not gonna be able to get the maturity, right? You know, I always joke, if you have a choice, one of your choices is yield to call, that should be the thing you take, right? Uh, factors affecting uh, marketability of mini bonds. Uh, we, we talked about most of this ratings, you know, the higher the rating, the more liquid or marketable, I shouldn't say liquid marketable, the bonds will be. Uh, call features will affect the marketability of the bond either in a good way or a bad way. You know, the interest rate or coupon will affect it. The block size will affect the, again, you know, guys who work bond desks don't like five bonds, you know, like 50 or a hundred. Uh, liquidity is how quick you can turn it back into money. Marketability is how quick the price, the dollar, the yield price, the issuer's name and local or national reputation. So I'm coming to you from Nevada. People have heard of Clark County. They've heard of Las Vegas. They probably haven't heard. We probably got some uh, county you never heard of. So, you know, if I'm a broker here in Las Vegas and I'm cold calling with muni bonds, it would behoove me to pick a bond that somebody's heard of, you know, Reno or something. And by the way, not only is that a good thing from my perspective, it's also a good perspective uh, thing to have from what we're talking about, right? You now the ability to get in or out of it, right? Uh, we talked about credit enhancement. Uh, we talked about credit, the credit uh, and liquidity support, you know, how many people make a market in the bond, how many bond desks are active in this marketplace. You know, there are 50,000 municipal issuers with $4 trillion in debt and outstanding. And so, you know, I told you my Mariposa County GOs aren't gonna have a big marketplace for them. They're not going to be very liquid. They're not going to be very marketable. I know that's 80% of that is uh, Yosemite National Park. And outside of the Yosemite National Park, nobody's ever heard of Mariposa, but San Francisco or Los Angeles or San Diego. Uh, now we're talking. Uh, pricing of municipal securities, accrued interest, very testable. 
Now we have this thing called the Uniform Practice Code. Uh, you can imagine what a mess the securities industry would be if everybody did it differently. So we all agree we're going to conduct business the same way. And that's called the UPC, Uniform Practice Code. And that standardizes uh, practices. I should standardize practices and the secondary market. We all agree that we're going to be doing things the same way. And so we all agree that the settlement for muni bonds is going to be T plus two, the second business day after the trade date. And we all agree that the buyer owes the seller, the buyer owes the seller the dollar amount of the accrued interest uh, calculated from the dated date up to, but not including the settlement date. And again, in the lecture, I go through a couple of these. Uh, I haven't had anybody in a while tell me that, uh, you know, they bumped into having to calculate the number of days of accrued interest in a while, but it, it used to be pretty standard uh, test fodder. So we calculated from the date to date, the last time the paid, bonds paid interest. So, you know, if it was a J&J &J bond, it paid interest in January, I sell it to you today. I say, listen, you're getting a check on July 1 from Clark County, Nevada, because that's the Clark County GO. And, you know, I had the bonds for January, February, uh, March, April, and part of May. And you say, uh, Dean, when I get the check, I'll send you your pro rata share. I say, no, let's just figure that out right now. So we calculate from the uh, a dated date up to, but not including the settlement date. And in uh, munis and corporates, we use a three a 30 day month and a 360 day uh, calendar. Um, you know, I've said, if we have a zero coupon bond or an OID, we were going to amortize the premium downward. That's called decretion. So if you buy a muni bond at a premium, you don't get to decide how to set that up on your tax return. You're going to do straight line amortization downward on the cost base. That's called decretion. And again, I have that a couple of times in the lectures for you to do. That's about a 50 50 on where you're going to have to do that on your actual exam. Uh, accretion of the discount amortization of the premium. You're more likely to get the amortization of the premium. So uh, let's make sure we got a muni bond bot at a premium. That's the one that's more testable. Uh, must do straight line amortization downward. All right, so let's see. We got accrued interest, accretion of the discount. Definitely should know the relation of bond prices to changes, right? I mean, inverse relationship, interest rates go up, bond prices go down. Uh, I would definitely know that longer term bonds are more volatile than shorter term bonds. And I would know that bonds with a lower coupons are more volatile. And again, I could also do that with, uh, it looks like I'm spelling volatile wrong, but uh, I could do it the other way, right? I could um, say that uh, shorter term bonds are less volatile and uh, higher coupons are less volatile, right? Uh, yields tax equivalent, ooh, you definitely gotta be able to do that. Uh, I'm working on a lecture for all the math that's found in your, your uh, series uh, uh, seven, I'm gonna call it series seven math or calculations. And this is definitely something you got to be able to do tax equivalent yield. Probably should be able to do both, but tax equivalent yield is where you take the uh, corporate bond, the taxable yield, and you times it by 100% minus the customer's tax bracket. And that gives you the uh, tax, whoop, that gives you the tax-free equivalent. Now in your tax bracket, what is it like? Now, because if you're in a 20% tax bracket, right? That means you're not taking home 20, 20 cents of every dollar. And so we go from tax, uh, tax taxable yield to tax-free equivalent. And then we should also be able to go the other way, which is to take the tax-free yield, the tax-free yield and divide by 100% minus the tax bracket.
And that will... And that equals the taxable equivalent yield. Yeah, because we got to be able to term, ter, uh, determine suitability. By the way, you definitely want to be able to do uh, suitability questions that are math because that's, you know, be able to do that, right? So definitely want to be able to do that. Uh, I'll leave it to you to review the lectures. I show you how to do that a couple of times. And we'll also have another lecture where I show you just all math on, on series seven. Uh, let's see, uh, the capital gains on mini bonds are always taxable. So the only component to mini bonds, if you buy a mini bond low and you sell it high, you owe a capital gain tax, right? So if you're in a muni bond mutual fund and the manager sells a bond, there's a gain that gets passed through to you. So the only component that's tax-free is the coupon. The only component that's tax-free. is the coupon. Um, let's see, current yield, definitely got to do current yield. That's current yield is what it pays you divided by what it costs you. The vast majority of series seven math is division. You can't decide what it, uh, to do. That's what you should do. What it pays you divided by what it costs you. Divide it by so in a uh, bond, what's going to pay you the muni bond? It's going to pay you the annual interest, and you're going to take the annual interest and you're going to divide by the current market price of the bond, or what you paid, basically. Definitely should be able to do that. I don't know of any draw in which you're not going to have to crunch uh, current yield. Uh, basis points is based on yields. Remember, you have a bond point. That's different thing. Bond point is ten dollars, but a basis point is uh, ten cents, basically. So, you know, if the difference between a bond that pays eight percent and a bond that pays uh, eight and a half percent, you want to sound like a player. You wouldn't say a half a percent. No bond guy would say that. A uh, bond guy would say the difference in those two are 50 bips or 50 basis points. And I think of it as 10 cents if we were talking about price, but uh, let's see. So let's see, basis points, uh, bonds in default. I would know that a bond in default trades flat, no calculation of accrued interest. No, so we've had some horror stories. I mean, muni bonds are considered to be the second safest form of credit uh, after, you know, uh, government bonds. But, you know, they municipalities go bankrupt a lot less than do corporations. That being said, though, there's been some major, major defaults, right? Orange County, California, Detroit, Michigan, uh, you know, Jefferson County, Alabama, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I could, you know, go through a list. But once the bonds are in default, it makes sense that they trade flat because the whole point of calculating the accrued interest is that you know, uh, you're know you gonna get the check. And so once the bonds are in default, that's no longer the case. Uh, let's see, um, tax treatment of municipal bonds bought a discount or premium. We talked about that. We said uh, discount isn't a problem in terms of a test issue, but premium most certainly is. You're gonna have to do that straight line amortization downward called decretion. Uh, your tax status is gonna be huge in terms of determining suitability. And then state and local, because if you buy the right bond, it might be triple exempt, right? New York City has a city income tax. New York State has a state income tax and the US government has a federal income tax. So if you buy a New York City bond, it would be exempt on all levels, local, state, and federal. So that's definitely a suitability question, right? Uh, you could also get that accomplished with doing, um, uh, doing a, a territory. We talked about computation of the taxable equivalent yield. You're gonna have to do that. We've talked about accrued interest. We talked about AMTs for industrial development revenue bonds or industrial the woman agency bonds, we say they are not suitable for somebody who's uh, you know, subject to the AMT. Uh, we have uh, taxable bonds like Build America bonds we've discussed. Uh, bond qualified means that the local bank and a lot of communities, I give you an example of Mariposa, the uh, bank may be the only person's capable of buying the bonds and they don't have any reach outside of the local community. So uh, banks are allowed to buy certain types of bonds and uh, 
collect the tax free and they deduct the interest, the carrying charge to give them an incentive to, to hold the local muni bonds. It doesn't have to be local, but I mean, anybody tell me they've seen anything about bank qualified bonds in a long, long time. All right. So that concludes the explication of muni bonds. Looks like I'm going to come in a little under an hour. So with the three hours of lecture and now this hour, that's four hours of munis on you, uh, for you. And uh, I'm trying, I have, you know, listen, if you're local to the channel or loyal to the channel, I should say, and you know, you work hard, I'm willing to meet you halfway. So usually I put this stuff out uh, a little lengthier you know, time. I'm usually putting it a week out or so, so people can put it on their schedule for the, the premiere. But I have somebody who's testing Monday and, uh, you know, he's uh, been a pretty loyal user and he's been giving me feedback, which is always helpful because, you know, I, you know, I'm trying to design the channel for you guys. So uh, since that's the case, I'm going to put this up either Saturday or Sunday, because we also have lots of weekend test takers and boy, kudo to your weekend warriors uh, that are, you know, studying and doing your weekend study thing. Um, I don't know how some of the people do it. I mean, I just don't, you know, I'm, I, I just, you guys are heroes if you're trying to do this um, like that. Anyways, let me get this um, done here. Uh, where we're at right now is we're, again, we're in that section three there, uh, providing customer with information about the investments. And uh, I'm going to put this for either a Saturday or Sunday. I'm thinking Saturday, this is Friday that I'm coming to you. Uh, I think I'll put it on Saturday as a premiere. And if you want to join us for the premiere, uh, what I do, and I think I've said this before, is I run a live chat alongside of the uh, lecture. Uh, and so you can ask me about the you know, lectures or, or the uh, lecture we're watching together on the premiere. I'm thinking three o'clock tomorrow, Saturday is when I'm gonna uh, do the premiere. But you can also use that chat as a way to ask me about any other thing that's on your mind. If for some reason you're an SIE person or you're a 66 or 65 person, uh, that that's fine too. I'll probably put something on the channel trying to explain to people uh, what what the alongside chat is about. Okay, so hope you found that helpful. And like I see, if you decide to join us for the premiere, I'll see you uh, tomorrow about three o'clock.